thank you, Lord. Well, the Lord is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and be seated. You have your Bibles, turn them to Ephesians chapter 6. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 10. Remember, we've been discussing, we've been talking about the armor that God has given us, the weapons of our warfare. We are in a war. Amen. But most importantly, we are in a war that we can win. Amen. It may not look like it. It may not appear like it. It seems many times that the deck is stacked against us. Amen. That we're fighting against ourselves. Amen. Paul recognized it in Romans chapter 7, 8, and 9 when he cried out to the Lord, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Amen. So that phrase, Paul took it. He took that phrase, amen, because it was one of the uh, punishments of the Roman legion. When you committed capital murder, amen, in the, in, in during, during the rule and reign of Augustus Caesar, they would take that body and they would strap it to you. Amen. And everywhere you went, you had to pull that dead body with you. Well, guess what happened? That diseased body would eventually disease you. Amen. So this is what Paul was describing when he would cry out to the Lord, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But then he cried out the answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, he shall deliver me. Amen. So how do you extrapolate that to modern day language? How can I use what's in the word of God and make it applicable to me that I can have victory? I mean, you know, you can't take this Bible and lay it on no demon. Huh? First of all, you can't see him. And secondly, he wouldn't do any good. Amen. And this is what this is what the armor of the Lord is about. Our armor. Amen. And part of that armor is the sword of the Spirit. So the word of God must become a part of you to the degree where what God has given you begins to work naturally. Just a bird flies through the air and the fish swims through water. It should be natural, amen, for you as a Christian to use what God given us. Amen? So we're on this earth, amen. We're in school, the school of the Spirit. And Holy Spirit is endeavoring to teach us how to win in a world where everything is working against us. Amen. And unfortunately, amen, because of the human nature and fallen nature, the enemy will use people you know, people that are close to you, to do what? To get you in the flesh. To get you to acting like you used to. Your old life. <laughs> Amen? Don't y'all look at me like y'all been saints all your life. Amen. You remember the days when you can control your tongue. You remember the days when you picked the fight. Amen. When you remember the days when you didn't turn the other cheek, you was ready to cut somebody's cheek. Amen. Amen. But, praise God, we are citizens of heaven. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And so, amen, we have this, we have this tremendous assignment in cooperating with the Holy Spirit to help us to bring victory, amen, or salvation, as James puts it, to our soul and victory to our flesh. Amen? So look at verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. After everything that Paul has said, so he's, gonna, he's surmising what he just wrote. In these final verses, be strong in the Lord. There's no place in the Bible God told you to be strong in yourself. 
be strong in the Lord. So that means God has given you something to enable you to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he says, put on. So that means that's something you have to do. Put on. So the strength of God, the might of God, comes to us by putting on the clothes of God. Right? And it's all, it is, it is all tied to us skillfully using the word of God. Now, brother and sister, listen. When it comes down to difficulty, when it comes down to hard times, you, you're going to reach for what you believe in. Right? You're going to turn to what you trust in. Amen? You are. If you, I've trained myself, amen, that when I feel sick or don't feel normal, I've trained myself to turn to the Word of God. I don't turn first to medicine because I don't have a medicine cabinet, first of all. <laughs> See, you're going to turn to where your trust is in. So you get a headache, instead of using the word, you're going you're to turn to what you believe in. So, you know, the sad thing about it is most of us take that stuff and don't even know if it really works. But we think it does. We believe it does. So we turn to it. Well, I turn to the word in the same way most people reach up and grab for a bottle of medicine. I, listen, I have nothing against taking medicine. Don't get me wrong. But if I'm not bleeding out or anything, <laughs> amen, then I have learned to do what? Skillfully use my faith. And as you use it, it grows. So I have confidence now in releasing my faith. I do what Jesus said in Mark 11, 23 and 24. I speak to it. Amen? Is that what Jesus said? Mark 11, speak to your problem. Tell it to be removed. It will obey you. Amen? Amen? Why would why will your body obey you? Because God made you the custodian of your body. When some invades your body, you have the right, you have the authority to use the name of Jesus and command it to respond. So that's what I do. So that's what I've trained myself to do. So I turn to the word. And by so doing that, amen, I don't spend a lot of money on medicine. Amen. Even when it comes, sometimes, you know, some food, you know, disrupts our system. You know, and and we can and it can get pretty painful. Amen. And I remember my mom back when I was growing up as a kid. I don't know if they really make the stuff now. They call it X Lax. E X L A X. And uh them old folks always constantly had us going to the store to get some x lax My God. You know, like I said, I don't know if they make it today. I remember one time, you know, before I became a Christian, I, you know, you do like mom do. You do like what you, were, you, you, you saw others do, you know. Went and bought me some one time, and my God, you know, I was on the, in, on the highway. Ooh. Cheekbones were squeezing. Trying to find an out of house, trying to find something. I said, oh, my God, this stuff ain't good. Amen. Never took it ever again. Amen. So when something uh, just don't agree with you, lay my hands on me in the name of Jesus. Amen. I, took, I take seriously what the Lord said. I speak to it because I am custodian of my body. Amen. And just like the enemy, where there, where the, where there is a weakness, whether it's a physical weakness or a spiritual weakness, the enemy, when I mean spirits, will come in and try to attach itself and compound the problem every time. So this is why I address the problem quickly. 
So this is what I'm this is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about put on the whole armor of God. Listen, all of this equipment that God has given you operates by words. By words. The shield, the sword, the shoes, the helmet of salvation. They all operate by words. They are all energized by words. If you could see into the spirit realm, you could see it shines brilliant, a brilliant light. It is energized by your spirit that is energized by the word of God who is Jesus. Amen? So he tells us here, put on. So that means there's some work you have to do. You have to meditate the Word of God. You have to get the Word of God on the inside of you. That's how you put it on. And then you have to do what? Use it. What good is it me buying a gun, say, for protection, get it in my house, put it in a lockbox, and then when a burglar comes, never go get the gun? Why buy the gun? Hmm? What good is it? I'm going hunting. I'm going I'm to I'm learn how to hunt. What a good is it to go and get your 30 odd six, you know, and your guns, you know, and then driving out where the moose is and then leaving it in the truck and then coming out and go eye the moose. What good is that? Why did you get them? Well, it's the same way as Christians. You have to put the armor on. You have to put it on. You have to do your part. Amen? Because if you don't do your part, then guess what? As a Christian, you're going to suffer defeat at every turn. Remember, the enemy is after several things when it comes to you as an individual. He knows that you have an assignment from heaven. That's the reason you're on this planet. No one comes to this planet through a woman's womb that, has, that does not have an assignment from God to be here. So he wants to stop that assignment, first of all. Amen? The enemy never, ever wants you to awaken to wake up and to realize who you are in Christ Jesus. That is dangerous to him. So he's a master illusionist. He does everything he can to sidetrack you, keep you distracted, keep you from, keep, keep you putting all of your energy on things that don't matter, that are not worth your time. Ultimately, why? So that you won't be able to rise up and stop him. Amen? The Bible said concerning Jesus. He went about doing what? Good. That's why God raised you up. He went about healing all who were possessed of the devil. Here you go. Because God was with him. What did he do? He put on the whole armor of God. Amen? And demons knew him. Brother, sister, when, you're, when you begin to transition from one degree of glory to another, when you begin to grow up spiritually, just like you grew up naturally in your mother's home, the enemy recognizes the authority that you have in the name of Jesus. He recognizes this. So he wants to stop this. And you need to recognize, amen, when the enemy is working against you. So God, Paul says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. They're coming. They are coming. Listen, they are uniquely fashioned according to who you are, your personality, and your weakness. Even when the devil talks you, he talks you to... He talks to you in the first person, in the voice in your head. You think it's you. <laughs> Amen. It's not even your thoughts. Come on. Listen, let me tell you something. Let me, let me give you a secret. Let me tell you something. Don't tell nobody else. <laughs> the most holiest saint of God have found thoughts in their head they resent it. You know what I'm saying? But always remember this. Thoughts may come and persist in staying. Listen to me. Persist in staying. 
but thoughts that are not put in words or action die unborn. You hear what I'm saying to you? They die unborn. And so the enemy makes these weapons that God has given you inoperative, amen, by the battle that is going on in the inside of your head. You're foolish to think you believe, think you're the master of your own ship. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to think. There is a spirit world that is very real. If God was to open all of your eyes right now, and you see into the spirit realm, it will scare the hell out of all of you. The things that are in that realm. Things you cannot even describe. Most of the crap you see in movies and on TV are in that realm. Because the enemy invades the imagination of men and they put it on the big screen. Some things are undescribable. You know what I'm saying? Undescribable. But Jesus said, he has given you authority over all the powers of the enemy. So that means, amen, we need to learn what belongs to us. We need to know how to operate in what was given to us. That's why we go in the school, in the natural, Right? Right? If you, somebody, if you went into the doctor's office, you went into the doctor's office and you start looking around on the wall and he, this is the same doctor going to do surgery on you. And then you look around on the wall and you see his degree and it says Reader's Digest on the top of it. <laughs> no doubt you get up, get your clothes and leave. You don't want nobody who got a <laughs> degree from Reader's Digest operating on you. Well, it's no different spiritually. Amen. You want someone who's been trained and know what they're doing. God wants you to know what you're doing. Amen. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Our war is not against humans. Unfortunately, the devil uses humans. Even Christians. Even Christians. But our war is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities. It is against powers. It is against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places for satanic divisions. So Paul says, he encourages you in verse 13, take unto you the whole armor, every piece, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. That evil day is a bonus. And that evil day is also every time the enemy chooses to pick a fight with you. Amen. Well, it's about time we pick a fight with him. When you make it up in your mind, when you get up in the morning, that you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit and make it a point to try to do good, you're picking a fight with the enemy. Amen. I mean, just sometimes, I mean, try this. Be standing in line at the store, and it said, oh, I'll pay for that. People look at you like you cuss. And they look around like, am I being punked? You know, I mean, just say, I'll pay for that. Oh, no, 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 no problem. No problem. It's a gift. Seriously. This is the kind of world that we live in now. Everybody's suspicious. There's very little good left in the world. This is why God put us here to do good. Do you hear what I'm saying? To do good. That's just one of the ways of doing good. A smile. You ever seen people? <laughs> Listen, I'm just like you. Thoughts come to my head too. You know, I stop many times. You ever stop and held the door for someone and they act like you didn't, wasn't even there, just kept on walking. My thoughts say, yes. And then I got I to gotta pull in the thoughts. <laughs> Huh? But that don't stop you from not holding the door for the next person. If you go with the crowd, you end up a sourpuss. That mess would attach itself to you. 
We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And Jesus wants to get out. The Jesus inside of you wants to do good. Brother and sister, you should make it a point. You should make it a point. Amen. Ask Holy Spirit. Look for an opportunity to do good. See, because this is how Holy this listen, this is how God works. When a person think about that, and they think about that goodness that was done to them, a free flow of light begins to come to them. And the Holy Spirit now has an opportunity to minister to them. See, that's what you're doing. You're planting light bombs, so to speak giving Holy Spirit and you don't have to say a word amen you know but unfortunately you know you can't hardly tell the Christians from the non-Christians today come on they dress the same they act the same they got the same sour look on their face like they're carrying a dead rat in their pocketbook or purse, like they're smelling something all the time. You are the light of the world. There should be a difference in you. People should sense you before they see you. They should sense there's something good about you. Why? Because Jesus is on the inside of you. Let him out. Amen? Stand therefore, having your lawns girt about with truth and having on the breastplate. This is what we're going to deal with a little bit, real quickly. The breastplate, this part of the armor of righteousness. So Paul lets us know that righteousness then is a weapon. Amen. It's a piece of armor, right? So it's a weapon. Well, how does it serve as a weapon? Right? This is what we want to look at. 2 Corinthians, very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What does that mean? First of all, it can mean that God don't want you hooking up, marrying someone that don't believe what you believe. What do I mean? Don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. You ask for trouble. Oh, but I love you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Here's a clue. Here's a hint. The Lord said there is no fellowship there. There's no fellowship. There's no growing together. And what communion or common union had the light with darkness. Now look, at God calls the believer righteousness, the unbeliever unrighteousness. God calls the believer light, the unbeliever darkness. Now look at Isaiah chapter 59. I'm just showing you scriptures that shows you how this, this, this breastplate of righteousness beneficial to us Isaiah 59 verse 17 for he put on being he being Jesus Isaiah is prophesying about the Messiah Yeshua he put on breast he put on righteousness as a breastplate he's protecting his heart enemy. the enemy wants you to fall in love with him he wants your heart and a helmet we 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 we, we, we studied that piece of armor. The helmet of salvation upon his head. He put on, now watch this. He put on the garment of vengeance for clothing. So you got the breastplate. You got vengeance, clothes over it. And was clad with zeal as a cloak. The cloak was what? A mantle. Now tell me, that person wasn't ready to fight. But you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Huh? We're not fighting like the guys out there in Afghanistan 
on other places. Our war is spiritual. So listen to me, brother and sister. Your first line of defense in winning this war against the enemy, to having a good life, for being a good soldier, is controlling your tongue. All of your weapons begin to go to hell if you don't control how you talk. If you get around a negative person, most make sure you do both of the talking. We've all been around. It feel like that somebody took to throw a bunch of mud on you. Feel like you feel dirty, don't you? Because words are spiritual and they are alive. Amen. So, now listen. There is times when you do everything that is right. You watch your word. You speak the truth like the Bible says. You say what you're supposed to say, but there are times that the enemy still gets through. Why? Because there are weaknesses on the inside of you that the enemy lay claim to. So God will allow you right in the midst of the battle he will pull you right in the midst of a battle where the war becomes more what? Internal than external. So regardless of where you find yourself, whether the war is outwardly or on the inside of you, where you are the problem and you are the excess that the enemy has taken hold of, how are you going to win? In the same way, same way, you got to watch your words. Huh? You start declaring, it's this breastplate again, over your heart, you just start declaring what the, um, what the Word of God says concerning you. You start declaring how God sees you, not how you presently are. God knows how you presently are. Everyone around you knows how you presently are. But do what the father of faith did. Abraham, Romans chapter 5. Call things that be not as though they were until they are. Amen? See, this, this is part of after you've done all to stand, stand. First of all, to keep from being pushed back any farther in your fight against the enemy, first of all, you control your tongue. You just start declaring what God said. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Let the strong say, uh, 6 a, I'm healed. By your words, you're justified. By your words, you're condemned. So you mark a line right there where you're not pushed back any farther from the ground you've already gained by controlling your tongue. Declaring what God said about your situation. Not what you presently have. You understand what I'm saying? And as you begin to declare, amen, then what happens? Then wisdom comes. God begins to speak to you, amen, about your dilemma, about your situation. And God will help you dig yourself out of the hole that you've been in. Regardless of how long you've been in that hole. It can be five years, ten years, twenty years. It can be, it can be as far back as in your mother's womb, ancestrally, you know, attached to your DNA. It doesn't matter. And then you make it through that. Remember I told you before. You, can, you have to te- keep making those type of stands. You have to keep putting forth those defense. Amen. Until Holy Spirit helps you do what? Pull the root out of that that's in your life. What's causing you to do that. Listen. You, again. The enemy is a great illusionist. And he will make you think that you're responding to something, that the reason that you're acting the way you're acting is because of something on the outside. No, it's because of something on the inside. You're only responding to triggers on the outside. But the reason is on the inside. So we have internal walls and we have external walls. The enemy can have you implode. Amen. You'll never know victory on the outside. You'll never be able to bring victory to other people's life. And ultimately, this is why God saved you. Amen? This is why he left you here when you got saved. It's not only to teach you how to overcome, 
but to help others overcome as well. So, to understand why righteousness is called a blessed prayer, you have to understand, again, first something about Roman soldiers. Breastplate. Now remember, Paul's illustration about our armor was taken from the attire of a Roman soldier. Listen, if you ever see a warring angel, Micah, they're all dressed the same way Roman soldiers are dressed. Same. If you ever see an angel, a warring angel, a guarding angel is the average size of, of humans, the average height, you know, five feet, nine, six feet, guarding angels are. They're not made for war, but they will fight. They carry swords. But because they are guarding, they are there, they were given to you. All, all saints of God have fallen the earth. They follow you everywhere you go. When you leave your house, two stay at home at your house, and two follow you wherever you, wherever you go. And, and so they're given to you not only as messengers to speak into your ear, to try to get your attention. They're, they're there to help lead you in the way that you should go. Amen. But they can call for help. They can call for help, warriors of God. And so your, your, your fighters, your warriors, you know, they're 60 plus feet tall. You ever see them at war? It's a fascinating thing. Well, this is what Paul was thinking about. He was looking at the Roman soldier when he was writing the book of Ephesians. So, the breastplate, the Romans, was it was the most elaborate and beautiful of all the pieces of the armor, whether bronze or brass. It was the first thing you noticed about. It went from the top of his neck to his knees. Remember the hard part and then it had the feather part that came down to his knees. It was the heaviest piece of all the clothing. And the beauty was enhanced by using it or the walking, walking with it on. So, so it's not only then a defensive weapon to protect us, but it's also an offensive weapon as well to assist us. One way, one way, the, 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 remember I told you the, the Roman soldiers, they, everything they did was to maximize death to their enemies. Now of all the types of soldiers in that day, it was the Roman soldiers that Paul, you know, used a lot of his teaching and illustrations from. What did that tell you as a Christian? Amen. Not the enemy. You are the most deadliest thing in the earth. You are God's killing machine. Amen. So what they did, they're the one that devises the hanging on the cross. And let a person just hang out there just hang and then break their legs where they could no longer pull up because they would suffer from it. I mean, they maximize, you know, killing. And so their armor, it shined, it shined literally like when, when the sun hit, hit it, it projected rays of light that blind, that blind its enemy. So when darkness tried to fall upon you, the light of righteousness will easily repel it. Well, first of all, because you are the righteousness of God. That means you are right standing with God, and the enemy have no right to do what he's doing. That's a legal, that's a legal thing. But guess what? You have to enforce the right. Right? You have to enforce it. Though you have, again, you have angels there that are there to help you, to assist you, but you have to initiate all these things because they can't do anything against your will. They don't know what you're willing to do until you initiate it. 
When you initiate it, they got your back. Amen? They got your back. Righteousness is the presence of God itself. So, so you have to understand that as a Christian, someone wants to hurt you. You have to know this. But as Christians, we don't think about that. I'm not talking about getting a phobia, you know, looking for a demon on every rock. That's not what I'm saying. But for instance, today, how many of you ever thought today, I am a spirit being? How many of that thought came? But see, but that type of thinking, you must constantly be aware of. Because living in this world, we're earthbound. Well, being earthbound and being a human, a normal human, then you have limitations. How many of you know you don't have limitations? This is what this book is about. This is what this Bible is about. is to show you, to tell you, that you are limitless in what you can do. Because heaven is backing you. The spirit realm, amen, is backing you. And God has given you resources. And we are talking about some of those now. The, the armor of God. And so, thinking, being aware that I am a spirit being. I am a spirit. See your spirit. Clothing your flesh, not the other way around. It brings what? It brings the superhuman mentality. It also makes you aware when you leave out your door, amen, that you are in a war. It doesn't matter if you can see your enemy. You're in a war. Your enemy can see you. Amen. And you are created to operate in both worlds. And you should be able to hear in both worlds. Amen. It's very important, Christians. It's very important. This is one thing that, that, that the military does in the inception of new recruits. First of all, they break them mentally. I can remember. I got in the Air Force back in 1974. Got off of the bus. You know, guys standing up next to you peeing on themselves. Them GIs get up in about half inch from your face. Yelling and spitting in your face. Your mama can't help you now, boy. And they want you. They want you to hit them. Some of them guys get so mad. I've seen guys sit up there with their fist ball and them GIs looking down and hey, hit me, boy. Hit me, hit me, boy. <laughs> See, what do you want to do? They want to break your will. Break you down to nothing and then start building you again. Amen. It is no different than God's arm. When you come to him, you have too much of the world in you. You think like the world. You act like the world. Amen. So Jesus says, come and take my yoke. Look at the picture. I remember my granddad, when he didn't have tractors in his day, he got his two bulls that he had with yokes, and he stuck it on their necks. And they would always put a, 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 a bull who's trained in with a bull who is not. And that's, that's the picture Jesus is giving. He's yoking you to him. And through his word, he said, take my yoke and learn of me. Learn how I do things. Learn how I think. Learn how I talk. But in Christ, as Christians, this is our primary failure, and that's why we are defeated all the time. We think there is no connection in what we say. There's no connection in what we do. But you understand, as Christians, it is all connected. Your greatest defense as a warrior is your mind. Understand this, all of your armor operates through your mind. Amen. As a man think it in his heart, so is he. That's what the scripture says. What are you thinking about yourself? And this is what Jesus is saying. 
think the thoughts that I have concerning you. Amen. It changes your perception. It changes how you see the world. Amen. It, cha it, it gives you the heart of the Lord. That the Lord loves people. And he comes to do what? Save them from themselves. That's you, brother and sister. It is you now that he wants to put on display. And he begins by letting the light shine from your armor. Amen. And as the light shines from you, there is a purity. There is a cleanness. There is a goodness that is perceived by people as they come into your surroundings. They may not know what it is, but they know that it's something different. That's what you bring to the table as a Christian. That grows, that increases as you walk with God. Amen? You hear me? Look at it real quickly. First Peter chapter 1. So you have to understand as Christian, someone wants to hurt you, first of all. Every time you leave out, someone wants to hurt you. So this is why you wear these clothes, this, this arm. The enemy will persistently tell you you are not righteous. You are not valuable to God. The enemy will consistently go into your mind, your memories, pull a picture out, and show you how you used to be. See? See? Well, then you pull a picture out and show him. See? See? I'm the righteousness of God. The moment I confessed Jesus as Lord, I was changed. I know I look the same on the outside. I know I got the same pug nose and bald head, but on the inside, I am different. So you have to tell yourself that. The enemy will convince you. And then especially, he'll just sit back and say, I'll wait. That demon will sit on the cupboard of your house and sit, sit, sit up and wait for you to fall on your face because he know you are. Because you're not perfect, right? You're growing into the things of God. So he'll wait till you fall flat on your face. And then when you fall flat on your face, you know, a curse word slip out, or you fall and, and, and drink or smoke or something like that, and he'll get down in your ear and say, see, 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 I told you. I told you you wasn't different. I told you you didn't change. But you better go back to the word. Huh? Go into your mind. Pull out the word. First John 1, 9. Listen, devil, since you can't read, read it to him. If I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me, cleanse me, and heal me. Huh? Now you're right back in good standing with God again. That's what the devil hates. He hates mercy and grace. He hates the fact that God will forgive you when you confess your sin, when you come short. He hates that. Because now you're back in good standing. You've been washed. The protection is back on you. He hates it. How can you, how can you lose with a situation like that? The devil knows it. So remember, remember now, the word devil means one that strikes again and again and again. He's trying to penetrate your mind with doubt unbelief and lies constantly constantly when you're in a battle inwardly an enemy coming against your mind many times you feel just as drained as you did if you work eight hours a day listen because the strength for your physical body comes from your spirit And if you work all day, guess what? Physically, then you got to do what? You got to refuel. You got to eat. Brothers and sisters, simply by getting up in the morning and breathing and going out in the day, amen, you are using spiritual energy. You have to refuel. You have to get in the Word of God. You have to talk to God, wait on God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Just by, I mean seriously, 
just by sitting still, quieting yourself, putting your thoughts on Jesus, causes your strength to be renewed. Amen? It's like you take your phone, plug it in the wall, it's charged. That's the picture that the Bible gives when you wait on the Lord. The spirit man is being recharged. Why? Because you're using spiritual energy all the time. And just like you, just like your phone, if you don't hook it up, you're going to get that little red dead battery. You know that dead line is on? It comes up on your battery. That's what happened to most Christians. And again, the enemy sits back and he waits. He waits. Because he knows again on the inside of you, he can start this internal war. He can access his weakness. So he wait and wait and wait until you don't do what you're supposed to do. And it increases his chances of winning. You understand what I'm saying? 1 Peter 1, 3. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird them up. You just can't let your thoughts go, go anywhere. Amen. Gird them up. Gird them up. Stand God on the avenues, amen, that the enemy tries to come into your thought life. Stand guard. You are in control of your imagination. This is what Peter is talking about. Be sober. Don't be a fool. In the spiritual meaning, being sober, understand that you're in a war. Understand what's going on around you. Understand that this war is real and know how to fight it. Amen? In the natural, if you're not sober, if you're drunk, you don't care what happens. And depending on how drunk you are, you don't remember half the stuff you did. So the man says, be sober and hope to the end. Never stop hoping. Hope is the canvas that you write up on. Okay? 1 Peter 1.13 It is the canvas that you write up on. Every picture that you see in museums or around, that picture was first where? In someone's imagination. And then they took paint and brush and began to do what? Write up on that canvas, paint up on that canvas what was first in their thought life. And then we now enjoy the beauty of it. That's what hope does. You read the word of God. You know that you are not presently like that. You know that. But you hope. Huh? You hope that you are what God says you are. That means you got to get in the word, right? What does God say about you? And that's what you hope. Listen to me, this is a very powerful truth. And this is what you hope. Now you're writing the picture of that on the canvas of your mind. And that's what you see. Huh? If you, whatever your problem is, you're hoping that you're free from that. You, 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 you see yourself free from that. You see what God says about you. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I will conquer this. I will overcome this. That's your hope. You're writing that. And then what? Faith makes it a reality. Then you begin to declare it. Bless God, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Now everything within you begins to pull you to that reality. Everything within you. The angels begin to pull you to that reality because you're talking God's language. Amen. This is God's goal for you. This is God's destiny for you. And then you begin to do what? Then on the inside of you, this is what you begin to desire. And you make steps to do what? Act it out. You ever seen people that have given up hope? They've given up hope. 
<coughs> it's difficult. You will not be able to help them unless you restore their hope. When you restore their hope, then the expectations change. The desires change. Then they begin to make effort, get up, so to speak, to make an effort to do just the opposite, right? And it's no different spiritually. So this is what Peter is saying. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation, revealing of Jesus Christ. So let's say it a little different. Peter tells us, as the righteousness of God, you can expect Holy Spirit to bring you revelation that will pour his grace into you, which is God's ability and power. Brother, sisters, listen. God don't expect you to try to do anything by yourself. But you have to cooperate with him. Amen. Again, what the scripture says, as a man thinketh, so is he. You have not because you ask not. When your thoughts are in line with what God says, then God can come alongside of you and pour his ability in you. And then come within you the desire to do what? To want something different. To desire something different. Amen? So, what am I saying to you? You need to make the fact that you are a righteous person, a key part of your mental makeup. If you don't, you're going to be whipped. Even before the battle starts. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's very important. Now, if you stop and think about it, you do all you do this all the time in the natural. This is why you've gotten as far as you have. Well, in the same way, recognize the spiritual makeup of your being. In the same way you spend hour after hour, day after day, building up your natural man, bettering yourself naturally. You have to spend just as much time or more when it comes to the man on the inside. Listen. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in this physical body. And you have the authority to change your world. God has given you the key to do so. Amen? Let me give you three other scriptures that I'm done. Scriptures on righteousness. Look at 2 Corinthians real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he had made him to be sin for us. God made Jesus to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. That brings a whole different perspective. Amen. You're not a worm crawling in the dust. When you recognize who God is and that you have now the authority to come boldly into the presence of God simply by closing your eyes and calling on the name of Jesus. Amen. You have God's attention because you have been made righteous because you have accepted God's righteousness who is Jesus Christ amen that's that's the way you deliver a depressed person that's the way you deliver a person who's sunk in despair if they do not if they don't grab hold of something in the natural that they think is worthy you know to grab hold of and changing them they won't do it now that's natural thing but Jesus Christ is that to us in every area of our life right every area 
we are faced with different things, different situations, different circumstances. And we can look unto him in every single one of them. And our perception is changed. The way we see things and the way we see ourselves. This is what, this is what Paul is saying in Corinthians. Now Romans chapter 3 verse 21. Romans 3 verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. So there was some righteousness in the law. But guess what? Could nobody keep it? <laughs> nobody could keep it. Right? A bunch of do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts. He did more don'ts than do's. Now, if you're going to try to bring that into the new covenant, you just missed it. You're trying to bring the law back into grace. How do I get grace to me? and make this thing not a bunch of do's and don'ts. Huh? By simple prayer. Lord, help me do this. Now you're not looking to you. You're looking to him. That's one of the reasons he came inside. To lift you up. To overcome all the things. Now watch this. All the things you don't like about yourself and all the things he don't like about you. <laughs> Amen. That's why he came on the inside of you. See, but God is more tolerable to you than you are to yourself. God is not as hard on you as you are on yourself. Huh? You miss it. <laughs> You know how you do whatever you do. Why are you getting all put out for? God knew you was going to do it, then take him by surprise. Amen. He is great. I say he is great. So the righteousness without, the righteousness of God without the law is being manifest. Witnessed by the law and prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is, now listen to this, here it is. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That's it. Believe in him. Receive his righteousness. Righteousness simply means right standing with God. That breastplate you have, it gives you the right to speak in the name. It gives you the right to use the name of Jesus. It gives you the right to receive what God has given you. It gives you rights. Amen? Upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, that's one. Romans 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, talking about Adam, because Adam threw us under the bus, we all are born into sin. There's no way out of it. Amen. If you came here via a woman, wound, you were born in sin. Oh, I'm a good person. No, you ain't. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because of one man's offense because of what Adam did. All right? And death reigned on all of us. We were born in the world. We came in dying. <laughs> Amen. The moment we were clothed with flesh, we started dying. Because of what one man, Adam, did. Death reigned by one much more they which receive abundance of grace that's me that's you and the gift of righteousness righteousness is a gift it comes in the package the package is Jesus the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by the one who gave the gift, Jesus Christ. Huh? You may not be reigning over your problem now, 
But guess what? If you keep walking in righteousness, it will lift you up. You might not be reigning over your situation now. But to steal a, a phrase from old. Keep hope alive! <laughs> who was that? At least you black folks got to know who he was. Huh? <laughs> it wasn't Aaron Shopton. What was that other one? Y'all say it. Y'all even know you're black hair. <laughs> huh? Jesse Jackson. Who, who said Jesse Jackson? Huh? No, you didn't. What did you burn? <laughs> Jesse Jackson. <laughs> you know, when back in the 70s and then we go up with all his speeches. Keep hope. Hope alive, you know, but that should mean something to you as a Christian, amen. I'm not there yet, but I will keep hope alive. I can't, why? Because of grace, God's supernatural ability and power, it's just not unmerited faith. We know we didn't marry anything. We deserve death. But because of him who lives in us, he wants to reign inside of you so that you can reign in life. Reign over your situation. Reign over your circumstances. Huh? That's why he came inside of you. Hallelujah. So I've listed a number of things that you need to do as a Christian. Nothing's automatic. Everything, unfortunately, as believers, everything in this life, it has been given to us freely by our King. But we must fight for it. Not to get it from Him. We must fight to make it a reality in our life. Because there are real beings out there in that realm, in that world who's trying to stop you at every turn. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Come on, stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Come on, bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. Say this with me. I am more than a conqueror. Come on. I am more than a conqueror. Through him who loved me and saved me. I can. I can. I will do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because he is for me, he is more than the world against me. Father, I just thank you today for your great love, your goodness that you have poured out to us and all who stand here now because you are faithful. You have proven your ability to win when you died in our place, when you took the punishment that we should have taken. But in the same way, because we have received you, because we have made you king, in the same way, we can receive the victory that you secured. We thank you, Holy Father, that you are raising up a people that loves you more than their own life. And because of that love, their willingness to surrender all to you 
will be apparent in these coming days. We thank you, Holy Father, that in your fighting for us, you are making us worthy victors. You are raising us up to sit with you as kings and priests unto our God. Thank you today for the war clothes that you've given us that we can internally and externally win this fight. Even when the fight is within us, we can overcome. We can overcome. Because of our love for you, we are willing to hear what you say. We are willing to do what you did. We are willing to lay down our own will and ways and to follow you. Thank you today for your amazing grace. Come on, just lift up both hands and thank God for his word. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for that word. I pray now that you allow that word as water so soaking in the ground. Allow that word to seep, seep, sip, seek, sink deeply within them and find good ground. I pray, Holy Father, that the enemy will steal not one truth and that they will bring forth a hundredfold. Holy Spirit, as they go throughout their day, continue to unveil the truth of what you have said. And show them today, Father, show them that they are a great part of the heavenly team. And that you have brought them into the kingdom for such a time as this. And that they bring something to the table that heaven needs. Holy Spirit, encourage them right now. Encourage them in the faith. Thank you, Daddy. Do it for me, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I pray that you got something out of that. Don't move. Praise God. I want to invite you.